I have been a private investigator for most of my life. I feel it important to tell you, at the earliest juncture, what I do, why I do it, and the unspoken rules of engagement when revealing information to the masses at large. I've seen far too many inscrutable types just pulling stories out of their ass for a quick buck or completely disrespecting the names and memories of those they were paid to investigate. I won't be doing any of that. Not when what is going on concerns all of us. My name is Wilson. I'm a new HPI that takes most of my appointments online and with very little face-to-face contact. Not just because of the current social climate, but because I like to be on the go when I'm working. I live close to the Rainbow Springs State Park in Central Florida. It's a great place to visit for your mental health and it keeps me fit, so you can imagine my surprise when a job comes up directly linked to that park itself. If you're unfamiliar with the missing 411, it's a book series by David Polites chronicling the sheer volume of missing persons cases in national parks across the United States. People who vanish in short time frames without a trace, some found inexplicably far from where they started without any logical explanation for how they got there, and bodies left in conditions that make your skin crawl. Florida doesn't even crack the top 10 for total missing persons, at least not officially. On the back channels, however, there's a lot more to go by. Historically, young people have wandered into the park when drunk, high, or just downright horny with a partner and either gone off the face of the earth or found dead much, much further than where they started. My first investigation into the park came when an irate husband was adamant his wife had been cheating on him and wanted me to tail her on one of her midnight second pins. The guy was rough around the edges, but he paid me well, so I obliged. It didn't take long for the spouse to go wandering, and sure enough, she met in the parking lot with the husband's sister, looking giddier than a foodie in front of an all-you-can-eat buffet. I took the info back to the husband, and in a complete 180, he simply chuckled and said, What can you do? I'll file for a divorce and get my stuff. Thanks, man. He paid me extra for my troubles, and I went home, treated myself to an extra-large takeout, and forgot about it. Two days later, I got a call from my colleague in the precinct. The husband was found sat in a boat, naked under a blanket and drenched in blood, sobbing like a wild man. The rangers asked him what had happened, and he said, It wasn't right. I should have been enough, and now I can be. Before they could clarify, they realized what he was wearing. The bowie knife cast aside in the boat, and the cuts on his arms. It was the skin of a woman. His sister. When he was questioned... His sanity clearly waning, he smiled and told officers, The Baron of the Woods has her now. He's keeping her safe until I'm ready. He was found hanging in his cell before he could be brought to trial. A bloodied message left on the wall. The Baron provides. That one took a while for me to get over. And to this day, I don't like the skin on my chicken. Ugh. I've had a terse conversation with my contact over at the PD who gave me a polite but firm talking to about the confidentiality of the case. Reminded me I'm just a PI, and once I'm paid, that's the end of it. What you hear, what you see, it stays in the parks with us. Got it? He looks serious. Deadly serious. It didn't suit him, and while I didn't fully buy it, I wasn't a fool. I placated him with a few drinks, and we forgot about it all. That is, until the Pine View field trip. I'd been tasked with observing and investigating a counselor who was suspected of being actively high on the job and dealing to the students. So, knowing they would be off grounds for the school trip, I once again tailed. The middle school trip had a group of 22 students that went into the park one summer for a weekend of bonding, fun activities, and memories to last a lifetime. 18 would emerge with trauma that would stay with them for the rest of their lives. I was camped up a ways back and scouting for any signs of the counselor either being high, showing withdrawal, or offering it to the kids. It was becoming obvious that there wasn't anything of the sort, so I instead decided to keep tabs and relax with a couple of beers, enjoying the night air. According to the witness statements, it started on the first night. A group of five friends were in the tent closest to the embankment where a large swath of trees that led for miles was situated on the opposite side. 
The youngest, Dylan, complained repeatedly of splashing coming closer to the tent as he was trying to sleep. None of the others believed him and convinced he was just trying to scare them and told him to sleep it off, which he did until it happened again and spooked the second kid named Bryce. The other two, Mike and Grayson, calmed them down and told them not to complain to the counselor as they liked the spot. The witness sleeping with them, Danny, said he couldn't hear anything and thought they were playing a stupid prank. By the second night, however, things escalated dramatically. Danny claims he was awoken by the sound of splashing outside and muffled groans. He looked around and saw Dylan was out of his sleeping bag. Worried he may have fallen into the water, Danny went outside into the darkness to call for him. Danny claims he saw a figure in the shadows, maybe waist deep, that was beckoning to him with one arm bending at a weird angle. Danny didn't move and called out to Dylan again, at which point he says he heard Dylan's voice but that it was weird, like someone doing a really good Dylan impression, but off. Something overcame Danny and he took a step back as three other shapes rose out of the water, all beckoning with their arms bent at odd angles and calling his name in some sort of off way. Danny says he screamed and ran into the tent to wake the others, but the bags were empty. At this point, I'm awake now, in my little campsite overlooking, and I can see Danny running to the cabin, screaming as people rush towards the shallows. Dylan, Bryce, Mitchell, and Gray were never found. The only thing that showed they stepped into the shallows at all were some clothes, and most disturbingly, arms that had been left floating in the place where Danny spied them. After that, I stepped up my research into the local legends around the park and disappearances that hadn't gone on public record. Brick wall after brick wall hit me before I caught a break. Someone had heard what I was doing and looking into what went on in the park, and I received an email. The email my assistant forwarded was titled, Disappearances in State Park. Help. Dear Mr. Cooper, I hear you have been taking cases for those who go missing in the park, and I'm hoping you can help me. My name is Marco, and I'm writing you in hopes that you can help me with something that has long plagued my family. I'll get straight to the point. Every one of my children has gone missing when they turn 18. I'm a proud father of six, two girls and four boys, a busy household at one time. I'm sure you can imagine. There's Michael, 24, Peter, 22, Yulia and Thomas, 21, Jonas, 17, and Yana, 15. All my children besides Jonas and Yana are missing. Mr. Cooper, and all of them were last seen heading into the Rainbow Springs State Park. Jonas' 18th birthday is coming up and my wife and I cannot bear the thought of losing another. I realize how far-fetched this must sound to you and you undoubtedly have your concerns, but if you are at the very least willing to meet with me, I will explain further. Please, our family can only take so much turmoil. We need help and there's nowhere else to turn to. Yours faithfully, Marco Baldoni. I blinked and made sure Dolly, my PA, hadn't sent me spam by accident. She confirmed she had not. I reread the content of the email three times or more before doing some research into the park itself, knowing full well that all state parks have varying degrees of missing people, but never hearing of multiple siblings. Scouring the articles, I could only find one on the eldest son, Michael, from six years ago providing minimal information, save for an appeal and a shot of him with his family, a tall, fair-skinned kid with messy, curly black hair that stretched over his brow and dangled in front of his eyes that were hidden behind thick glasses, a cheeky smile as he stands arm in arm with his other siblings, proud parents, standing behind him at a family ceremony. I don't know what it was, but something in the photo tugged at my withered heartstrings and my afternoon schedule wasn't exactly packed so I decided to meet the family for a coffee and hear them out. I had no idea how much this case would haunt my dreams for years to come. I drove up to the Baldoni household and immediately knew I was dealing with a grief-stricken family, broken beyond repair. The lawn was barely kept up. Hedges were jutting out. The neighbors murmured fervently to another as I trudged up the driveway to the house. Not so much judging as they were silently looking on with pity one word repeatedly being picked up as I reached the door. Cursed. Marco answered the door before I could even wrap my knuckles for a second. He was disheveled, 
frantic, and above all else, tired. The man I saw in the photos was overweight, salt and pepper curly hair, and a wide grin showcasing the pride in his family. The man in front of me looked 15 years older, frail, balding, with a permanent grimace as if bags under his eyes weighed his whole face down. Ah, detective, please come in. He opened the door wider, and the distinct odor, which permeated my nostrils, really hit me strong. But I had been to far worse places, and followed with a smile as we sat down in the living room, a place that had clearly become a shrine of sorts to their lost children. Photos of the kids in various stages of their lives littered every piece of furniture from the fireplace stand to the coffee table. If I would looked for long enough, I'm sure I could have traced each child's milestone from birth to disappearance in the photos. Newspaper articles and trinkets. Mark sat down as one of the children brought in some lemonade and sat next to him, arm on his shoulder reassuringly. I take it this is Yana? I asked, staring at the young girl, trying to gauge any information I could without asking. She seemed to be in good health, tired like her father, but much more steadfast, though that could be chalked up to her age. He nodded, and she introduced herself, a soft smile breaking across her face. It's nice to meet you. My dad says you're here to help find out where my siblings are. Marco interjected, almost like a trained reaction. Find out what happened to them, Yana. We know where they are. His hands fell into his lap, and his entire body language dropped further. He'd already resigned himself to their fate. I took a sip of lemonade and took out my notepad. Why don't you just tell me where this all began, Marco? What happened with Michael? Marco's eyes widened at the mere mention of his son's name. His lip trembled, but a reassuring squeeze from Yana kept his resolve. He nodded his head and got up, looking at a series of photos on the mantelpiece. Michael was our firstborn, a truly gifted boy with computers. He was remarked as a prodigy from a young age and entered a scholarship. We immigrated here when he was four, and you can imagine the issues we faced from the outside world. So our pride in him was immeasurable, but never to the point that we pushed him too hard. We just wanted him to be happy. He sighed and continued. But Michael was the sort to expect too much from himself, and it frequently resulted in him locking himself away in his room if he didn't achieve perfect scores or an experiment didn't turn out the way he wanted. He started researching into ways to help broaden his horizons and deepen his understanding of how things worked. That led him to some research which completely consumed him from the age of 17. Marco picked up a photo of Michael's graduation, tears staining his cheeks. My brilliant boy was obsessed, barely spoke to us in the lead up to his 18th birthday. If he wasn't working on his experiments, he was out taking long walks until God knows when. We couldn't chastise him when we didn't know his return. And we just thought he was going through the usual issues a boy his age does. So long as he took some mace and kept his phone on, we let him have his freedom. I see. Well, parenting is a tough journey, and he was your first. You're bound to make errors in judgment, Marco. It's not your fault. I gave him a reassuring smile. He seemed like he wasn't the cause of Michael's downfall, or disappearance. That much was clear. He returned the smile with far less enthusiasm and continued. The night of his 18th birthday, he packed his things up and came down during movie night to speak to us. It was like the old Michael was back. He was practically glowing, and I was so shocked at this, I didn't even question the positivity. When your son has barely said three words to you for a year, and then suddenly wants to engage in long conversations tell you he loves you and hug you, well, you just take it for what it is. Marco sniffed, his voice shaking. What a fool I was not to notice the signs. Michael waited up until we were asleep before taking the car and driving to the national park. The car was found parked up without an issue and no sign of Michael beyond entering the visitor's gate. The guard said he seemed like a normal kid, but with a determined look about him with a large backpack on his person. They never found a trace of him, detective. With that, Marco sank down into the couch and wrung his hands, full of shame. I knew that look, and I knew I had to ask the obvious, painful as it might be. Marco, was Michael suicidal? Did he have any mental health problems? His eyes met mine and the hurt in them was apparent. He'd been asked this before. Everyone has said the same thing to me. He must have been depressed. Typical foreign family putting pressure on their bright boy to give them all an easy life. He was a shut-in 
so it's no wonder he killed himself. Journalists, neighbors, teachers, state troopers, and police officers all think the same fucking way. He slammed a fist down as Yana stared at him with tears in her eyes. My boy was loved, he was cherished, we never had any signs, and we encouraged communication, and we still do. We were a loving family, we talked things out, and we did not shame our children for failing. He didn't, he couldn't. He pressed his head into his hands and softly sobbed as Yana comforted him. I'm sorry, Marco. We can discuss your other children another day if you'd prefer. I realize this must be painful for you. I had to ask to eliminate the possibilities. If they've already gone down that road, then I assure you I won't do the same. You have my word. I leaned forward and put a hand on his forearm, hoping it would help him. He nodded and composed himself. So, it went Peter, the second oldest, always looked up to Michael and idolized him. He was more artistically inclined and focused diligently on his poetry skills, wanting to be just as good in his own craft as Michael was, you know? The two found their respective differences fascinating, how one could be so focused on the creative arts and the other on science, but covering for the other's weaknesses. I dare say they were more like twins than brothers at some points. Peter worried for Michael during those dark days, but he kept the family together with movie nights, poetry recitals, and would leave small sticky notes around the house with fun messages to keep our spirits up. As Marco smiled, I looked around and saw the fridge, washing machine, kitchen door, and every other appliance still had this distinctive yellow sticky note with it, and small, carefully worded messages affixed to them. But all that changed when Michael disappeared, I assume. I pressed scribbling more notes down my pad. He nodded and asked Yana for a stiffer drink. She hesitantly obliged and walked to the kitchen. He became inconsolable, especially after the first few days of searching yielded nothing and people very quickly drew conclusions of suicide. He was like me, you see, passionate and fiery. He refused to believe Michael would do anything of the sort and would get into all manners of confrontations with anyone who suggested otherwise. Teachers would kick him out of class for cussing out his peers who made unkind comments and he would eventually get suspended for breaking the nose of a bully who mimicked a hanging notion when referencing Michael. After that, he began writing darker focused poems and placing them on his front door. They made us unsettled, but we let him express himself. I took them all down after he disappeared though. That was too painful. Except for, he pulled out a crumpled note from his pocket as Yana placed a bottle of vodka on the table and he poured himself a shot downing it without hesitation as he read the note aloud. It calls to me from beyond the veil, a screaming, writhing, terrible wail. It wails and cries in a language not meant for man, but I will search for it in the only way I can. It lays in the grave of giants, hidden from view. It bears the soul of my brother, suffering renewed. Do not fret, do not cry, for I will return. The hearts of my family no longer will yearn. For the Baron of the Woods told me a tale. Keep my promise, and I will return from the Vale. It's strange to admit, but I felt a bitter chill run through me as he finished. Was I really to believe a teenage kid wrote this? It sounded almost... coded, like he'd read too many old gothic horror novels. But something within it rang true. A message within a message, maybe. Marco gave it to me shaking hands and continued. After that... He too left for the park. He was never spotted by the guards and he had gone on foot. A passerby said they saw him trudging in very loose clothing for the time of year when he went missing. They were concerned he'd freeze but said they felt uncomfortable approaching him. That it seemed like he was in a trance of sorts and thought he may be on drugs. They reported it to the ranger but nothing came of it. Marco sighed and poured another shot. The second of my children went missing and my heart broke even more. Again... No trace, but this time there was no conclusion of death. His case is still open. What a joke. A hollow laugh left his body before he necked back the shot and wiped his lips. Apologies, but I need this to talk about what happened next, you understand? I do, but I hope you don't plan on getting too intoxicated. It'll make my job hard to find them. Please, in moderation. I felt awkward telling a grown man stricken with grief what to do in his own home, but... This was still a courtesy call, and I wouldn't get very far if he was plastered. He nodded grimly and signaled to Yana to leave the room. 
Dad, I want to be here to help you, especially with mom being... She protested, but he silenced her with a wave of his hand and something in another language I didn't understand. He kissed her and sent her away for a few of these tense moments. She doesn't know the extent of the twins. Issues. I must confess, not all of them are missing. We do know where one of them is. His deadpan, bitter response catches me off guard and I sit forward, noticing something is off. Alright, I'm listening. What happened? He visibly shudders before continuing, getting up and pacing the room as if anxious. Julia and Thomas were twins, as you know. They were inseparable and like many twins, I'm told, they had their own habits and languages. There were so many times where they felt disconnected from the rest of us, content to spend their days planning trips together or doing their own thing. But as time went by, they became too reclusive. Maybe that was always the way it was going to go, one sibling following the other. But even when you see a car crash coming, you can't quite help but be devastated by its impact. Marco shakes his head, perhaps trying to rid himself of the mixture of guilt and pain, if only for a moment. They began communicating exclusively with one another after Peter left, becoming more and more hysterical in the lead-up to their own disappearance, but this was different to the others. I could see the morose expression grow from his face to his body language, and he grabbed something from the desk and tossed it in front of me, pouring another shot. We know where one of them ended up, he flatly added as my eyes darted down to the paper from a few years ago. Local teen found dead in unusual circumstances splashed across the front in gaudy font. A photo of a cordoned off section of the park next to it. The already tense mood grew worse as the article hung in the air for a few moments before Marco put his finger on a section of the map, and for the first time since we met, I understood why other PIs had either turned down this case or come up with nothing. Marco was pointing to the cave high up on the cliffside. Thomas was found inside there after people nearby complained of a foul smell and saw a bird scavenging nearby. He'd been missing for two weeks by that time, but he'd been dead less than that. A kid with no athletic ability, climbing equipment, or survival skills managed to stay alive and get himself up to such a high spot, six miles into a national park. He stared at me, incredulous. That's not possible, detective. My boy could not have done that in his own. Someone took him up there. The penny was in the air. So you think something has been luring your kids to the park for some reason? I pressed, trying not to sound insulting in my tone as I put pen and paper down for the first moment. He knocked back another shot and put another piece of paper onto the table, a map with directions and a piece of Peter's poetry. From the blackness he calls to me, a cacophony of agony and impropriety. To the old land, the baron beckons me forth. My twin dance is beyond my gaze her soul enraptured within the darkest maze. I am powerless to resist his siren's call, for he speaks in a voice of my brother, and I do not know how to defy my heart, for it is broken like no other. The map showed directions to an area not marked on the forest trails. It was shoddy, hastily drawn, and with unusual markings that Marco pointed out were definitely the twins' own language. I stare for a moment as Marco says what I'm thinking. Not something. Someone, detective. The penny drops. How did Thomas die? Where was Julia? Exposure, so they say. I've never been able to even spend any time with the body beyond a rushed verification. Julia was nowhere to be seen. Not a trace. He sighed and leaned in. Yana doesn't know we found Thomas. She still thinks he's missing and I cannot bear to tell her otherwise. You may have noticed the mother is nowhere to be seen. This is because the grief broke her heart. I couldn't tell her. It would push her over the edge. You understand? I leaned back and took a breath, running through the information in my head. When did Jonas turn 18? Last week. He's already behaving strangely, and we've kept him in his room for now. No matter how hard we try, they find a way to either lower our guard or leave when we are asleep. We must sleep sometime, and Yana is in no state to overpower her brother. I do not know what else to do, detective. Something is killing my family, and I don't know why. He puts his face in his hands and sobs as Yana comes back in to comfort him. I decide this is a good moment to take a breather and head for the hallway. The dusty smell of the house making me congested. He's wrong, you know. 
I spun around and saw Yana standing in the hall, a defiant look on her youthful face. What do you mean? Do you think it's something else? Mental illness, it runs in our family. I try to keep positive for dad's sake, to give him something to hold on to, other than grief, but... It took mother, it took Michael, Peter, and the twins. It's got a hold of dad, and one day, if I'm not careful, it'll have me too. My family hasn't ever been tested for anything, and my father is convinced that there's some curse on the family from the old country. But I think they're just sick, detective. Please don't make a promise you can't keep. That's all I ask. I don't want to lose another family member. She walked back inside and left me to ponder my options. I could leave a grief-stricken father in limbo and advise they see a doctor, or... I looked up the stairs, a single light on in the bedroom, and a pang of guilt in my chest. Or I could commit to the job and see where it takes me. Call me a fool, but I said yes. I told Marco to let Jonas out and I'd tail him. Much as I wanted to know more about the kid, I couldn't risk him recognizing me and giving me the runaround when it came to tailing. It only took a couple of nights for Jonas to find his way towards the park. The kid was fast, I'll give him that. Tall and lanky was summer wear on made him adept at traversing the underbrush and traipsing along the trail, darting left and right as he made his way deeper and deeper into the forest. I thank all of my weekends doing Wii Fit training for being able to keep up with this kid half my age. Eventually, I came to a clearing and damn near collapsed over myself in a heap. I wheezed and took a moment to recuperate, hoping I could hear for something nearby to tell me where he was and praying. I didn't go back to the family empty-handed. Sure enough, after a few moments, something cracked in the direction to my left. Swinging around, I saw a figure that had been watching me scuttle off. Thinking it was Jonas, I chased after and called out explaining that I just wanted to help. No reply. Typical. This time, I pushed through the stitches and the god-awful wheezing cursed my love of Chinese food, and powered on to chase after Jonas until the trees overhead began bloating out in the sky. Branches stretching over into the canopy that kept the warm moonlit glow from reaching me, turning the entire trail into darkness. I'd lost my way long before I decided to stop and look around, unsure of where I'd come in and where I was going. Silence permeated the space around me. It was unnerving. I pulled out my phone and put the light on to find my way. And I swear to God, if I had the ability to scream over the wheezing, I would have. It was Jonas, crouched beneath me, staring up with wide, manic eyes and smiling at me. He was bouncing on his tiptoes like a child at a birthday party. We stood there for a few seconds before he leaned behind me and giggled, leaping back into the dark and chanting something that seemed to come from all directions. From the blackness he calls with glee, a reunion for them, a reunion for me. Brothers, sisters, and mother attend. A time for broken hearts to mend, for they congregate in the grave of Tusk, and so I too shall join them as dust. For the Baron of the Woods, debt is paid, the Baldoni bloodline has been slain. I turned and saw what he had been looking at. To this day I have no earthly idea how something like this could be in the park, let alone anywhere on this planet. I'd somehow suddenly been standing on a small cliff edge, overlooking a sparse pit strewn with bodies and bones a mass grave known as an elephant pit. It was said that when elephants got to a certain age, they'd pair off from the herd and die in these vapid open lands. Their bones, all that remain after decades. But these were humans, some well-preserved while others were nothing but bones. All of them still clothed and chucked carelessly into the unforgiving soil. Someone put them there, I breathed. Turning around to look for Jonas, the chanting growing distant as I ran into the direction of his voice. No sooner had I started running did I catch something under my feet and stumbled down, toppling over head feet first until my head careened with something hard, and I blacked out. When I came to, I was being attended to by the park rangers in a familiar area of the park. Jonas blanketed nearby and looking as if he was on death's door. What, what happened? I asked, the ranger furrowing their brow as they stared into my eyes their colleague coming over. Concussion. He's not going to remember, they said quietly in the first ranger's ear. They nodded and the air of concern returned to them. You went off trail. We thought he'd stolen from you or something. Found you both passed out at the bottom of a nasty dip. One false move and you would have been lost time. Looks like someone out there has your back. Better thank the Baron when you can, he smiled with a wink. Thank the Baron? 
What? I blinked. My skull felt as if it were splitting open, and my head spun. He grinned again, and everything faded to black. It would be some time before I was able to make sense of that night's events. Jonas was brought home and had no memory of ever going into the woods. Said he just felt compelled to go for a walk that night, and that was it. Marco was overjoyed to have his son back and thanked me profusely, as did Yana. When I had taken a moment to have some quiet time, I asked him about a debt his family may have owed. He looked at me as if I had awoken the devil, and his jaw grew slack. In the old country when I was born, it was said I was a sickly boy. This was during the war and my parents could not bear any more loss and bloodshed. My mother told me that my father took me into the ancient woods and asked the Lord there to bless me and that he'd pay whatever price was needed. I always thought it was just some old country folklore, but he shuddered and took a moment. I think deep down, I knew what this was. But who would believe it? I couldn't bring myself to say I did, because I still don't know what I saw there that night. I didn't want to invite more trouble into this poor guy's life, so I left my card and told him to give me a call if anything unusual popped up again. That was two months ago. I still have headaches on occasion, and I don't go into the park for fun walks anymore. It feels wrong now. Sometimes, only sometimes I feel this unceasing desire to go off the beaten path and into the darker areas of the park, to seek out the truth of what I saw that night, and that feeling scares me to death.